Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And here we are, guys. Thank you for joining us today. I am uh, on Clubhouse as well as out on the restream watching your guys' comments. Hi, Jeans. Hi, Mommies. And uh, I'm a little off my game today. I'll explain it in just a minute. But uh, I want to bring my guest in rather quickly here. Helps me with how I'm feeling right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, the one and only Jakob Smirnov. I asked him to come in today because I was thinking about how crazy the world has become and last time i talked to him the world has not had not become so polarized and he has had an interesting career both from the standpoint of where he has lived what he's been exposed to and i'm you may not be aware but he had got a phd in psychology and leadership from pepperdine uh we'll talk about that in a minute as well of course he's ukrainian american stand-up comedian who immigrated to the united states in 1977 and uh before he knew it, he was sitting in the White House talking to President Reagan and then began uh, regular on The Tonight Show and began uh, seeing people regularly in Branson, Missouri, where he had his own third, his own theater. Let's bring him in here. There you Hi there. are. How are you, sir? There you I'm are. I'm doing awesome. How are you? Yes. I'm great. Fantastic. I'm doing awesome. So yes. I, and I want I want to take people through again your history and some of the stuff you've been doing. First, tell, tell us about your PhD program. Well, um, I got very interested in psychology, really, and got my master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and uh, then wanted to then became a professor at Missouri State University, teaching a course on happiness and laughter, and um, and then decided to get my doctorate degree at Pepperdine University uh, because I wanted to do more research on that connection uh, because there is a lot of laughter happens in the beginning of the relationship. And everybody, you know, I ask, you see, I have a theater in Branson, Missouri. It's kind of like my laboratory of laughter. So I've been asking mm. over 5 million people uh, do they remember laughter being part of their honeymoon stage of the relationship? And everybody applauds. And then uh, I asked them, would you go on a second date if you didn't have laughter on the first date? And no one applauds. And so it, yeah. uh, it, that was my curiosity. Why is that? Why is it that we uh, use laughter without uh, consciously understanding what uh, indication does it give us and why uh, it's so important to create laughter that we wouldn't even go on the second date if we didn't have it uh, the first date. So that's what and, got and have me you, to do all my have, research. Have you thought any more since you did your PhD a few years ago now, as you distance from that, have you had any new insights? Uh, for instance, you know, why people lose the laughter and how could they get it back? Yes, very much. Very much so. I think it's, um, I'm working on the book right now, Unconscious Attraction. And basically what happens in the beginning of the relationship, we create a facade that's our a conscious mind that is that knows how to meet the needs of the other person. Uh, and th uh, that's what makes us so appealing and attractive to the other person. And laughter continues, but... Uh, uh, scientists have uh, proven now that this effect of the dopamine and uh, oxytocin and serotonin cocktail uh, that uh, Mother Nature gives us, it lasts only about a year, year and a half. And then what mm. happens, we get busy with our own lives and we switch mm. from uh, conscious mind to 
unconscious mind that doesn't uh, it just it's it's more reptilian it's just survival mind as opposed to mm -hmm. thinking of consciously what is it that my partner needs and when we meet the needs of the other person laughter comes back and it's fascinating that's why when we go on the, on a vacation uh with your spouse without kids and all of a sudden you're having great time uh, at the beach somewhere in the sandal resorts. I'm not making a commercial, but uh, it, it's because we're focused on that person and their needs, and then laughter comes back. Are, are men and women different in terms of their proclivity to laugh in a relationship and what generates the laugh? I think we're different in terms of our needs. Uh, that is a big, big mystery because in today's world, um, the society is trying to make us the same, um, that, or at least saying that we're the same, that we have this. Uh, and then you as a physician, as a scientist, you know, it's not true. You know, that man's body creates about 10 times more testosterone than a woman's body. And woman's body creates like 30 times more estrogen than man's body. All of those things, we're ignoring that. But what it does, it determines that what our, our needs are. So here's, here's an interesting experiment that I, you know, been doing with my audiences. I ask them, um, uh, you know, I, I present the case. I'm saying that um, I believe that uh, man uh, need to, uh, they want to be acknowledged for things that we do for a uh, mm -hmm. wife or the family. And, um, and so I ask uh, the audience after I explain this, I go, uh, let me ask you how many men agree with that? And about half of them applaud. And then I say, well, that's only half because the rest of them are scared. To applaud <laughs> and and then I say, okay, how many men disagree with that? And no one applauds. So I said, mm. ladies, listen to mm. that silence. That's what they need. They need you to acknowledge what they do. And then I give him an example. I said, remember when he used to open the car door for you uh, uh, when you were courting? And and they go, uh, uh, they clap, they, yeah. And I said. Uh, do you know why he was doing this? Because he wanted to be acknowledged. And you told him, you're such a gentleman. Uh, I love when you do this. And then you stop acknowledging him for that. And he opens the car door for you at 80 miles an hour. And then you <laughs> wonder why. Um, and and then, then I do the same. I reverse this. And I ask, um, I said, so for man... It's important to be acknowledged for what he does. But for ladies, you do so much every moment of the day, there is no way to acknowledge all of that. And it's not as important to you. What's important to you is to be acknowledged for who you are, kind, mm -hmm. loving, uh, caring. And, and you can hear the pin, pin drop at that moment. It's like aha moment for the audience, like, because that's what he used to do in the beginning of the relationship as well. He used to tell you how beautiful you are, how smart you are, how kind you are. And, and then the women would show up in a nice little uh, short dress with high heels. And then they stop, men stop acknowledging them for who they are. And women uh, wear old pajamas and a T-shirt that says, I'm with stupid. And that's kind of what happens in there. And it's amazing that I, then I ask ladies, how many of you agree that it's your essential need to know that to be acknowledged for who you are? And they all applaud. There's never been a different case. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I believe. Yeah. And I believe if people are conscious about their understanding that the needs of men and women are different then laughter would be sustainable. Yeah, I, and, and are there different strategies that men or women, other than acknowledging the needs and worth, are there, do they respond to different kinds of sources of humor? 
Um, I, I think humor, you see, from that first date on, the humor doesn't change. They mm. tune in. It's like a, a piano uh, tunes <laughs> it, uh, when it's, yeah, it's tuned into the same vibration. So humor is just there. It's always there. It didn't change. What did change is the needs. And then the humor, you can, you can still say, uh, do the same joke that you used to get a laugh from her in the past, but you forgot her, uh, uh, her birthday. And all of a sudden that joke is not funny anymore. And so I'm saying that to me, that's where we need to focus on. Ah, there's no laughter. There have not been. What am I neglecting? Why am I, what am I missing? What am I? And you can ask your part, what, what is the need that I am not meeting right now? And hopefully they can identify it themselves. But there is like a, a wonderful book uh, by Dr. Willard Hartley. It's called His Needs, Her Needs. And mm. um, Dr. Hartley did a lot of research on this, and it matches my research. Uh, so what he identified, if you pick like 10 emotional needs <laughs> uh, for men and uh, women both that are important to both of them, um, and then he asked them to prioritize, to pick top five. And um, women picked uh, affection, conversation, openness and honesty, family commitment, financial support. Men picked um, admiration, sexual fulfillment, attractive spouse, a recreational companion, and domestic support. So there you go. If you have those five and five, you can create laughter and love, and it's all there. Interesting. So I, I might have to get that book. That's an interesting book. His, his needs, her needs, right? So his needs, her needs. Also, I love Harley. Comes right up here. I, I wonder if you would uh, also for this audience kind of review your history a little bit because it's so fascinating sure. when, when you were in, I didn't, I thought, I always thought you were in uh, Russia proper. I didn't realize you were in the Ukraine, uh, but it was the Soviet well, Union nobody, nevertheless. Right. Nobody knew about Ukraine uh, until a short time ago. So, uh, right. yes, uh, when I, when I came here, I was a former Soviet Union or Soviet Union at that time. And that's all people knew. And they associated Soviet Union with Russia. So I became a Russian comedian. Um, and, uh, and once you got that brand, you gotta, you gotta stick with it because I don't know if, um, I can reintroduce myself now as an Ukrainian comedian. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure if it's good or bad. Um, and <laughs> so what happened, what happened for me, uh, I came here in uh, that uh, height of the Cold War, and uh, I was kind of a, uh, do you remember a movie being there with Peter Sellers? You remember that yes. movie when he Chaun Chauncey, Chauncey Gardner, Chauncey Gardner. That's right. That was me right. in a way, because I didn't speak English well enough. However, I grew up in the Soviet Union, and I understood that socialism and I understood uh, what it was and it resonated, especially with President Reagan. He was very much into uh, using humor and laughter to make a difference. And he did. I mean, it, it was fascinating when I look at that and when I look back, I, I, again, I was an innocent bystander that uh, got got noticed uh, by Mitzi Shore at the comedy store. Um, and uh, this is the same time as people who I, you know, Bob Saget, who just passed away, but he was one of my kind of classmates. And we were, we were just doing comedy. And, uh, and then I got, uh, Robin Williams was there and uh, uh, got me to do the movie Moscow on the Hudson with him. And then I got, uh, I did a movie with Tom Hanks, Money Pit, uh, a movie with Richard Pryor, 
um, uh, and then a uh, movie with Meryl Streep and Jack Nicholson, uh, Heartburn. So I was really, I just kind of fell into it. I, I thought that everybody gets a career like that. Well, I, it wasn't, <laughs> you know, it, it was great through, 80, through the 80s. And then uh, the White House, they, they, I got a call from the White House and they said, we'd like you to come to Washington to perform in front of the Bushes. And, and I said, this will get me arrested. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then they were like, you know, no, no, this is to perform in front of President, Cab President Reagan's cabinet. I said, well, that's better than the Bushes. So mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, I got uh, on a kind of a, uh, on the same wavelength with President Reagan uh, and we were just uh, Soviet jokes, and uh, I was I was like a supplier. And even after he uh, was out of the office, uh, I would get a phone call from his office uh, in California. It says, uh, "Mr. President, would like to uh, go to lunch with you." And I knew what that meant. He needed more jokes. He wanted more. So we were just in, yeah. We would sit there and, and uh, exchange jokes and stuff like that. So, so it was a lucky for me. And, and then what happened, one of the kind of highlights that I would say, um, I get a phone call from President Reagan's head speechwriter. Uh, Dana Rohrbacher was his speechwriter. And he said, this is very confidential. President Reagan is going to go to Russia to meet with Gorbachev for the first time. And you made an impression on him. Uh, uh, President Reagan wants to do a speech in front of all the Russian politicians in Kremlin. So President Reagan asked you to write jokes for his speech. And I'm mm. thinking, if this doesn't work, I don't have any countries to go to. And so <laughs> I, 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 you know, obviously I was honored and I, wrote some jokes and they liked them. And, and it literally, you know, it, it, then, then Dana Robrocker said, would you, would you mind looking at the speech and just to see if the tone of it is right? And uh, I, I'm like, think I'm freaking out. I'm going, this is a guy who only like five years ago uh, wouldn't even think about living in a communal apartment of having this kind of, uh, that I'm going to be looking over President Reagan's speech. Uh, anyway, so I said yes, and I, but, but I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't care for the tone of it. And I, I told them, and they said, well, why don't you just rewrite what you think needs to be rewritten, which is a, more pressure. And but I did, yes. and they liked it, and that's how it went. So it was really a blessing uh, in disguise, and they got along, Reagan and Gorbachev, and humor was definitely a big part of it. Uh, that they were able to, yeah, big time, big. They tuned in. It was like their their first date, and uh, their mm. humor uh, matched, and that that's how. Uh, they stayed together kind of through the whole presidency of President Reagan. Hmm. What, <clears throat> you know, it, it seems like since I last talked to you, it seems like this country has gone through sort of something weird. <laughs> I don't know quite what, how to characterize it. But, um, yes. I, I'm wondering what you're seeing. I'm wondering what you're seeing. Oh, I am. I am seeing, um, well, I'm seeing a lot of what I uh, left uh, the Soviet Union for becoming normal um, in America. Uh, it's really right. a sad, sad for me. I'm kind of watching, like I'm watching uh, a, um, a a car accident in slow motion and I can't do right. anything about it. And I, right. I don't understand why people can't see that 
but here's an interesting there's a um a video on on youtube that you can find it it's like a uh a soviet kgb like high-ranking kgb officer who defected later on and he has a couple of videos there he is no longer with us but um, he, he explains how ideology uh, is, um, how it gets into the society. And they were masters at that. Uh, they knew that it's a, it's a long process. So uh, it, it has, and he explains it, how many stages uh, of that and how long, like stage of, um, making the uh, country unstable uh, takes like 20 years and they go in through the colleges and through the um, uh, for whatever uh, organization they can get into to infiltrate it's very subtle it's not just um, something that happens overnight and so uh, there was another uh, source that you might uh, look into. I think it's cool. The book is called um, "The Sword and the Shield" by a historian, mm-hmm. British historian, and a, an a ex KGB, different KGB agent, and uh, and they were saying in that book that when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, they ask the officer or the uh, uh, the person in charge of infiltration. Uh, he said, uh, unfortunately, I only, I only succeeded in two areas. Um, it's um, uh, to infiltrate socialism. And it was um, uh, Cuba and East Coast universities of the United States. And that was, mm. he was sorry that that's the only two places that he was able to uh, infiltrate. So what happens what- is, that the, this KGB agent that I'm talking about, I think his name is Yuri, but I forgot the last name. And he says that even if you tell people how you did it, even if you just open your cards completely and say, okay, here's what we did, people are already into ideology and they won't, they won't be able to, to see it. They won't be able to admit it or see it as, as reality. Yuri Bezmanov. Sound right? There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, yeah. I, I've actually seen that video. It, it, what was it like in the Soviet Union when you were there? And then try to oh. maybe correlate it with what we're, what you say you're seeing <laughs> here now. <laughs> oh, gosh. The government pretty much controlled everything. They would tell you what to do, what not to do, uh, who is going to work, how much money is going to make or what money they're going to give you and it, it just too many similarities uh who gets vaccinated who doesn't i mean it it was just bizarre uh to see this uh what i'm the most surprised is probably how quickly uh america who in my opinion was so freedom um like um, it, 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 the, the word freedom to me was uh, associated with the word America. And then this fear that came in with COVID, uh, how fast it was um, shifting in terms of like uh, restrictions and rules and regulations and all of those things, nobody pushed against it. That, that to me seemed very strange because in the Soviet Union, you know, they, they before, before, before I was born, uh, they killed over 40 million people who were uh, the middle class after the revolution. They needed to get, destroy them so they don't push against uh, the new government, the socialist government. So they had to be gone, uh, and then they starved them to death. They put them in Siberia. They did whatever they needed to do to get rid of them because they were they uh, 
uh, presented threat to the to the new regime, to the new ideology. And it's interesting that mm-hmm. the word political correctness was coined by Vladimir Lenin, uh, and uh, that's what was um, the uh, the the rules was coming from. What is the government? Uh, what does the government want you to say or not to say? And based on that, you were uh, snitched on. You were. Uh, uh, send away and nobody would know where you are, where people disappeared to just because they told a joke about Stalin or, or Lenin or something like that, or it could have been just a comment and all of a sudden they were gone. So it's kind of scary that this, this could happen. Yeah. Anywhere, right. That it ever, ever happened anywhere. It, it is, it's, I have the same reaction you're having, which is that this all seems so bizarre to me that people want to be told what to do and that somebody wants to tell them what to do. I, I all very weird. I, I, I feel like as they're calming down, they're starting to look at this with a little more of a jaundiced view, but it still was quite extraordinary. I, I, I agree with you. I, well, are, are you, yeah, I, are you, is there anything to, anything to be done? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I don't know, um, uh, uh, except to move to Florida, uh, or that, Texas, <laughs> or, or that. so I, at this point, I think America has to, uh, recognize, uh, what's happening, uh, to it, how, how precious and everybody wants to still come here because uh, this this um, freedom of able to make it or or not uh, is very rare. I mean, uh, there there are many places in the world that you can uh, you know, and becoming more and more as China growing, and it, it there's many places where they would tell you what to do uh, or subsidize you just to keep you uh, not rebelling, but America is where it came from. Um, it was the rebels that uh, wrote the constitution. Uh, it's the rebels who were saying, we are going to protect this unique opportunity uh, to, to be free to succeed or fail. Yeah, and it seems to be something that we, I don't know, don't mind squandering or don't understand is valuable or something. I, I don't know. It, it's really interesting to me. Uh, I, I I spent a little time in Texas recently. I go down there pretty regularly. And uh, when you go down to Texas, the first thing they want to tell you is how we value freedom down here. And no one's going to tell me what to do, man. And it's interesting coming from California it, it struck me, it, I was shocked at my own reaction to it. It struck me as odd. Like, doesn't somebody need, you, you might, somebody needs to tell you kind of what to do, right? You might, who knows what you're capable of. But it, but it, yes. but it, I was so surprised at my reaction that, that it, you know, complete freedom sounded threatening to me in some way from having been in California all these years where they're, isn't that interesting? Where they're telling you, me what to do and what to eat and where to go. And, you know, they're, they're constantly at my tuka, took us. And, um, yeah. y- you know, it, it's, it's interesting that a place that valued freedom sounded s- so different to me <laughs> that it almost was scary. It, it is, uh, it is. And, and it, it's, it's almost, <clears throat> I think it's kind of almost threatening to, um, to what the new ideology, uh, the book culture, the, um, socialism movement, whatever you want to call it, it it's it's fre- threatening to that culture that they have um, that there are places where people succeed um, not having uh, the government tell them what to do, and they still and and that's what America, the whole America, was like, and now it's becoming 
uh, separated by those states that are still willing to to um, evaluate and some that are not. I'm, I'm going to circle back around and ask you again, is there anything to, to do? I mean, how, how should we respond to this? Just let it, let it play awareness, out, see what happens? Awareness. Well, as a doctor, um, and you have a patient that is, you know, chronically uh, or possibly can die, uh, I'm going to turn the table on you. What would you tell them? Yeah. Would you tell them that there is uh, a condition that might kill them, uh, but they need awareness first? Am I right? Yes. Uh, awareness. I, I'm, I'm not quite following no. you. Okay. So let's say let's say somebody is sick. They have cancer, and you uh, you found that they have cancer. Would you want them mm -hmm. to know that they have cancer? Or would you want yes. them? Yes. Not to. Yes. You, you would want no, I because want them to know. Why, yeah. why? Why would you? Why would you not hide it and kind of say you know you you would want them to know yeah. because they need to want to they need to want to uh, get well right if you're not well and they need to participate they they also need to uh, help in the decisions they should be part of the decisions well, absolutely <laughs> and and get behind <laughs> yeah. you and you say I have a plan for your cure, but I need you to know that you have this condition and it's fatal. And that's where I see America needs to wake up and say, wait, wait, maybe, maybe there is some logic here that the way this is going, it's going to destroy what this country was found on. And then there will be not no America. It will be Venezuela, pretty much. You, you mentioned that the the you you called it the I think you said the woke culture, right? the woke culture. Yes. <laughs> woke. Oh, that's great. I'm back, by the way. Oh, my wife is back here now, and uh, <laughs> the woke. I like the woke it. woke culture. Uh, what what do we make of that? I mean, some of it's good, right? I mean, bring, we're bringing some good ideas in. Is it possible that we've just gone too far and that the the panic and the fear that the press, the press created around COVID took us to some strange place that we'll look at and go, well, let's not go back there again? Um, e e yes, I, I, I think the ideas are normally kind and loving, but they are the ones who um, they cover up certain things that we're not aware of, uh, and what does it? Where does it take us? So the free stuff that is being offered, where is it coming from? What does it do on the long run? Yes, we can print a lot of money and give it to people, but what does that do? Well, it destroys right. the interest. In, in creating something new because now you're being, you're like a, a lion that is in a cage that's getting meat every so many hours and you forgot how to roar. You can't, so, but if you let that lion out in the wild after several years, it will probably die because it doesn't know how to survive. So I, mm -hmm. I see, the ideas are interesting and, and sounds great. Let's give everybody free health care. Let's open the borders. Let's bring more people in here. But how do you sustain that culture that was so um, powerful and amazing? Uh, I remember having those conversations with President Reagan uh, when, when he was saying that, and I was totally agreeing with that, he would say, Jakob, do you think that we're different people, we're kind of people, Americans? And I said, yes, you are, because uh, people who come here had to leave everything they knew in pursuit of a dream that they had no idea if it would happen. I didn't, I come here, I didn't speak English, I didn't know anyone here, and but I was, I was, uh, I had this uh, incident. Uh, that happened in the Soviet Union that kind of might give you an idea a little bit of what 
what to tell, is this going to be the uh, the cruise? Is this the cruise ship story? Yeah, I want to hear that yes, one too. I told you that. Yeah, yeah. I remember it vividly, you and so it stayed with me. So good for you. Go ahead. Yeah, you want you want to tell it? <laughs> no, I don't think I, I couldn't tell it with the same flair that you did. It was just oh, okay, okay, so, okay, okay. someone okay. told you to stop being stop stop being good because you you you're, it makes other people feel uncomfortable if you're doing a better job than other well, people. Well, kind, so kind of. You were me, too funny. Let me tell you. Yeah. So I I was performing on the cruise ship. It was a new experience for me, and I um um I, I did it like a a week for a free because it was like a vacation. And then they asked me to stay on board. And I said, I would stay if you let my parents come on board, uh, give them a cabin, and I'll be happy to do this. They said, who do you think you are? We have thousands of people like you. Get out of here. And so I left like a, a dog with a tail between his legs. And then I go home and I tell my parents, I ask for you know cabin for you, but they kicked me out. And, uh, and I knew, I, you know, that it's irreversible in their uh, case. And then uh, about two hours later, uh, two hours later, uh, this um, messenger comes in with tickets for me and my parents. Uh, and I didn't understand it, but I wasn't arguing. And we went there and I got on board and I asked the cruise director, I said, what happened? I never heard that this could possibly happen. And he said, well, the captain liked what you did. And these cruise ships used to be leased to Americans or British or other uh, capitalist countries. So we learned, he said, the captain, the crew learned that if somebody is more talented, they should be rewarded more than just everyone else. And that's when the light bulb went in my head. It's like, wait, wait, wait. So are you saying that if I'm like in different country, I could live better life? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and so that's what started my, my quest to, uh, to, to America. And uh, that's the difference. Yeah, I, it, because when I, I... Uh -huh. oh, I lost you. Say it again. Yeah, I know. It's, I'm coming in and out here, but go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. No, uh, so so to me, um, that that one element that gave me a chance to be better to to succeed, as opposed to everybody was getting like 120 rubles, uh, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a street sweeper, whether whoever, whatever it is, you would get the same money. And people, the joke was that people pretend that they're working and government pretends that they're paying. And that's how mm. everybody lived. And all of a sudden, I see a difference and it flashes in my head. And I was like, wow, this is a, an opportunity. So that started that journey uh, that was not easy to get out, to learn the language, uh, to start performing. I mean, that was... Uh, when I look back, I'm going, wow, that was not an easy thing to do. But I had that understanding that if I am better at what I do, I can have a better life. It, I, and I, as I remember you telling the story about the cruise ship uh, last time you told me that story, it, it, you also said they sort of chastised you in, in addition for... To, to thinking you were special and could have a room for your parents. They, they also, as, as I recall, you told the story, d d told you you were being too good. You were being too funny because yeah, it, it, yeah. it made other people uncomfortable. <laughs> stay down, stay down. Don't stay. Yeah. Don't stick your yeah. head up. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that was totally different in America. It was like, yeah, go for it, man. Go for it. You know, I, I remember my, First job uh, in America, I decided I'm going to be a, a bartender, but I didn't speak English, a little problem. So, but I went to a school, um, it's a bartending school in New York, and they charged like $200 for two week training. And they didn't care if you spoke English or not. So they took my $200 and I was learning how to mix drinks anyway. 
I get a job uh, at, uh, there was a restaurant in New York called Mark, Mark, Monk's Inn restaurant, French restaurant. And I was supposed to be a, a barman in the service bar. And what attracted me because they, all the monks wore the monk uh, uniforms and they didn't have to speak. So I was like, yeah, this is mm. a job for me. So I go <laughs> there and I started uh, uh, mixing drinks, but I had no idea. I was so new to this. And then the waiters were mad at me and they would jump over the counter and make their own drinks. And, and so I oh pretty gosh. much got fired. Yeah. I got fired in the first night and then I'm sitting there in the steps mm. and, and I'm going, man, how am I going to tell my parents that I, I got fired. <laughs> and, and this guy, um, who was one of the waiters uh, from Czechoslovakia at that time. And he sat down next to me. He said, don't give up. Uh, let me help you out. Uh, we'll, I'll show you what more popular drinks are. So we did this. Uh, for, and I said, will they give me my job? He said, well, I'll talk to the manager. Let's see what happened. So I got my job back. And um, I, I was doing better. And next week, I was offered another job. Uh, for that bartending school to go to Grossinger's Hotel in the Catskills. And there was a beautiful bar and a showroom, 2,000 seats. So I'm like, oh, my goodness, I want to go there. And uh, But I was feeling guilty that this manager gave me my job back, and now I'm going to ask uh, to leave. And so I said to him, I'm really embarrassed, but I, I want to go to take that job. And he said... Yaakov, you're in America now. If you have an opportunity to do something, uh, you should take that opportunity. And he said, let me tell you one other thing. After this week of work, he said, if you ever need another job, you have it here. And I remember at that time walking on, um, it was it was Broadway, I was going to a subway, it was like two o'clock in the morning and the movie Rocky was uh, very popular at that time. And I was jumping up and down going, uh, ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum, ta -dum, because I, I, I was, was feeling funny. like if I can, if I can win over this situation where I knew nothing to the point that the manager said that he would hire me anytime uh, that I need a job, I felt like I had that American spirit that I can overcome challenges. And that's what I've been doing all of my life. And were you speaking, did you speak Russian and Ukrainian? Yes. At that time I spoke Russian, Ukrainian. Now Ukrainian is kind of English took that spot in my brain. And when I go to Ukraine, yeah. I can say a few words, but not much. Wow, how interesting! And, and and how did the you your English must have been improving rapidly for the bar owner it, to be able it, to communicate all that to you? And, and I'm wondering it, how the Czech guy was. you communicated was that all English? Yeah, yeah, but it was a lot of hands and you know emotions mm. and things like that. So, but so really, what he said was what he really what he said, Jakob was just. Get, get, move along, Yaakov. You, you, yes, take that job, please. Please take that job. You're, you're finished here. <laughs> but you thought what he said. Well, you thought what he said was, come here anytime. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Drew. That, Thank you for ruining <laughs> ruining my imagination. No, I'm just saying, there's, I, it, well, you're now, in that, that's why you're an expert in positive psychology now. You've, the guy told yes, you to scram and yeah. you heard, you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> that is not a bad way to go through life, by the way. And you said you're John C. Gardner. No, That's I'm sort not, of what he I'm was doing. I'm not complaining. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that I... And now uh, what's happening is um, Netflix uh, are doing a, um, a documentary on my life. And the, it's right. interesting to, right. to look through my videos and my uh, pictures that they need for this. And it just it's fascinating how many times... I perceived a failure, you know, because, because look, my career <laughs> just took off. I mean, again, there was a lot of challenges and stuff like that, 
However, think about walking basically into Hollywood and getting into right. motion pictures, right. having my own television show. I mean, all of those things happen. And that was, and then when 19, uh, 1991, actually, yeah, uh, David Letterman has a top 10 list uh, when the uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, the top 10 list, I make number one in the list, Yakov Smirnov will be out of work. And, and this was like funny at first, but then none of my, uh, none of my uh, contracts in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, Reno Town, they, they were not renewed. And so I started looking for a place where they did not know that the Soviet Union collapsed. So I, I ended up in Branson, Missouri. They still don't know. I'm not telling them. <laughs> uh, no, because, because yeah, this has been a blessing in disguise. And that's, so I looked at that as a failure in some ways. I'm going, oh, I'm just going to be there for a year. And, and then it turned out to be 28 years that I have my own theater. Wow. And I, I'm wow. very excited about that. Yeah. Amazing. So listen, I'm going to take a little break here. We're going to do a little commercial. Uh, and when we get back, um, we're going to take some calls. And I want you to talk a little bit about the uh, current geopolitical situation over there. So we'll be right back. Yakov Smirnoff, uh, Yakov.com. Be right back. Let's talk about our friends at Hydrolyte. I can't say enough about Hydrolyte. You hear me talk about them all the time. It gets me through workouts and medical procedures and colonoscopies. And COVID, it absolutely contributed to my recovery from COVID. Hydration is key to feeling healthy. And there's never been a time when that could be more important. We're in the height of cold flu season. Every headache has got you testing for COVID. Staying hydrated can keep the questionable symptoms at bay, and there's nothing better than Hydrolyte to get it done. Taking their hydration formula one step further, now there is Hydrolyte Plus Immunity. It starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients, plus each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water to make a great-tasting drink that is a 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all-natural flavors. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash Dr. Drew. And be sure to use that code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. We are back with Jakob Smirnov. Thank you for being here, my friend. So any, any, oh, by the way, hydrolyte saved my butt again. I, I right now have diverticulitis, which I get about every six months. And I got dehydrated with it too. And hydrolyte literally got me out of bed this morning. Um, but the the situation over there in the Ukraine, I'm, I'm certain you have lots of friends and family that, you know, you're sort of connected to, to what's happening. What, what, what's your assessment? Um. <laughs> I, I'm I'm married to a Ukrainian uh, woman, and so I definitely have uh, some some take that. Um, looking at her pictures uh, as we, I don't know if you could see it, but that's her. And oh, so I beautiful, yeah. I uh, so I'm in touch with them pretty much almost on a daily basis. Um, they are not. Uh, the the population the people that i know are not worried at this point uh, americans uh in my opinion are making a, a big story out of this uh and and there is a story for sure but i think the story is a little bit different than what's coming across the waves are uh, here um the the challenge is that nata NATO is um, trying to gobble up Ukraine. Actually, America wants it to be in it, and and NATO uh, is. But but I don't even know if NATO is really excited about Ukraine uh, that much. But that tension is scaring Putin. 
uh, if if you I mean it's literally if you had like Chinese uh, in, in pu putting bases in Canada or Cuba. or in Mexico Cuba or Canada yeah. Or, yeah yeah exactly they would yeah. be we would be we would be not happy uh, on this side mm -hmm. so the same thing Putin uh, and he's got a muscle to flex and he can scare people of course but um uh, the russian first of all you know the ukrainians that i talk to they speak only in russian anyway and if you look at um what happened with sochi or with crimea during that time if you look at the timeline uh, you will see that there there has been an, a major involvement of america uh, on on uh, overthrowing the government of Ukraine that was in cahoots with Putin, <laughs> and mm -hmm. by by overthrowing that government, it made Putin uh, nervous immediately, and he just took over Ukraine and Donbas. So, mm. in some ways, he's reacting to what America is doing. And I think we just need to understand that as opposed to just blindly say, well, he's a villain, he is a KGB, uh, you know, killer or whatever it is. Uh, but he's got a country to protect and he's going to. And I think that we really need to be, again, I don't know who's watching this, this show, but if they're watching somebody who's in power, say, you know, is it really... Um, that strategically important uh, that uh, Ukraine for um, for NATO, or is it just to provoke Putin? Right. So the headline tomorrow is uh, Jakob Smirnov is a Putin sympathizer. So anyway, oh. so, <laughs> so, that's how we'll get the numbers. Right. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, but but it does. But I I I I'm just not, at I, that. I, but but yeah, I'm jesting at that because you you said how Americans are making something of nothing or something making more. I, I don't I don't think I it's like nothing. We, I think it's actually very no, dangerous. You know, I, I, what's happening? No, I understand yeah. what you what you're saying. I, I understand what you're saying, but we're we're but in this I'm I'm framing it incorrectly. But what I wanted to say was something about our psychology, I, which is that I've been saying for a while that we become histrionic. We become absolutely histrionic, and I don't know if the press has done this to us or what. But that 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 personality change is sort of evident to me everywhere to the point where people are frankly delusional sometimes. Yeah, but it's presented to them that way. And when you say this is a, you know, third world war uh, to happen over the Ukraine, uh, you kind of go, okay, but are they worried? The Ukrainians, are they worried? Uh, they, you know, so it doesn't seem that way from my sources, my, uh, my uh, mother-in-law and my father-in-law, they live right there. And when you ask them, they go, well, yeah, so th they have, you know, tanks on the border. What else is new? Everything, it's, right. they used to be under, only 30 years ago, they were under the Soviet regime. So I, I, I don't know if it's, I'm not saying, I, I don't want to downplay it. <laughs> But I'm saying that there is a role uh, that Americans can use this, um, uh, uh, the government can use this, or they can look at that from the perspective of America. How important is that to America? And, and what consequences can it uh, create if it starts a third world war? What, what do they do? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So I'm going to get some calls up here. Uh, and those of you that come up uh, to to talk to us, you will be streaming on multiple platforms. Just a reminder. Anthony, what's up? Everybody cough. Hey, Dr. Drew. Thanks for having me. You uh, really quickly, I sent you an email in regards to Spread Hope Like Fire. If you could check that out. Okay. I sent it to contact at drdrew.com. Okay. Um, really quickly, um, what I also wanted to add to the conversation is the... Um, what I kind of looked into was psychologically um, back in the eighties. I don't know if you know much about, uh, I think it's called covert uh, 
coercion or something where the, uh, the Russian government had infiltrated or the KGB was potentially infiltrating uh, the U.S. government through the schools and changing the ways in which us as a society thinks well yeah that's what that's what uh, maybe you stepped in here a little late yakov i stepped in a little late sorry he was saying i'll let him explain it again because he he said exactly that the you were talking about the guy who failed because he only got schools yeah yeah it's a very covert uh process uh and even if you expose it because it's been going on for so long time (laughs) such a long time people have no um, even if you tell them that this is what we did to destroy uh, American dream, uh, people won't believe it. it, it that's right. how. Right. Leopold, that, put yourself on mute there. Oh, okay. Uh, go ahead, Jakob. You, you, you finish your yeah. thought there. No, this Sorry is how the how subtle how subtle they can be uh, to to do this, and they've been doing this around the world that wasn't just america they were doing it everywhere now isn't that more the uh seems like the work of the chinese more than russia and R- russia seems less yeah interested Absolutely. in doing that kind Absolutely. of thing I'm, i i yeah. think i i totally i see that as a major threat and americans don't necessarily see it that way leopold you're on with Yaku Yo- Yo- Smirnoff. I see it that way. Hey, Doctor. Hey, Doctor Drew. Hey, um, hey. Yeah. So, um, d- did you ever see the movie Wag the Dog? Because this whole I- idea of getting into war um, right now, um, especially when you know, all the polls show, you know, the Biden administration tanking. You know, all the polls are showing that uh, there's so that you know war is an easy way to distract a, a nation a world right um and of course it's a money-making machine for you know for the you know for the um the war complex right uh so i, I just find it interesting that you know this you know there are saber rattling and the whole thing um and uh i i mean what's your thoughts on it Yakov? Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. I have not seen the movie, but I will. Um, and uh, I will definitely look into it. But uh, yeah, it sounds right. It sounds uh, like uh, we're protecting this small country uh, that cannot protect itself. And it sounds great. Uh, we're the heroes here. But what's the cost of that? How are things in I Ukraine lost. these days? What's life like there? I'm here. Where Ukraine? In Ukraine, yeah. I, I, well, I wanted to go. Oh, yeah. I wanted. I've wanted to do. A, I wanted to go to the Black Sea. I wanted to see what it's all about. I want to see what's For going personal on. Personal reasons. My, well, I'm, I, I'm I from the, my great. family's from the Ukraine. So yeah, I I go there regularly. Um, when you are in the middle of like Kiev or other bigger cities, Odessa, where I grew up. Uh, you don't know that you're in the foreign country. You are. It's just very much embraced. Uh, all the all the brand names, all the stores, all the restaurants, uh, very good food. So I I think it's gorgeous. Uh, Black Sea, like Odessa, where I grew up on the Black Sea, the gorgeous hotels, gorgeous. Re- not making a commercial for it, but it's definitely something that you can. Totally enjoy, and uh, most people now speak English. Uh, it's totally different from where I came from. Uh, that was, uh, you know, communal apartment, uh, nine families living together. None of that is happening. Everybody's got their place. They have their cars. It's 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 pretty cool. It's extraordinary how quickly things expand and grow when you when you infuse it with a little capitalism, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And it going in the reverse when you take that out, because the Soviet Union, when it did came, when the czars were there, now there was a lot of poor, poor people, no question. Some some were, but when the communists took over, the country. Uh, died literally died i mean people were starving 
and they used to feed the whole Europe. And then all of a sudden they couldn't feed themselves. And it's because mm -hmm. the middle class were taken out. And then the other mm -hmm. people who created the revolution uh, stayed in power, the ones that were powerful. And the other people lived in a poor situation the way they used to anyway. Hmm. Did they take the middle class out because they were educated? Yes, education, also their uh, willingness and, and uh, ability to think for themselves. That's the mm -hmm. scary part for the government. They don't want that. When, when you they were, want, when you, when you yeah. were younger and living there, did you have an awareness? Did your family talk about this sort of thing? No, no. That's no. why I was telling you the story about the cruise ship because I was in such a bubble uh, and they were presenting America, you know, they were showing us, you know, movies like Three Stooges and they would tell us that's documentary or something like that. And they would believe- <laughs> What? What? Well, I'm exaggerating, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but, but everything okay. about America was like, the, these people are, they will sell their mother for money their own, their warmongers. Their, I mean, whatever it was, their machine was working to uh, keep us completely um, isolated from an idea that you can have some your own business, that you can uh, be uh, initiating something. Uh, my dad was an inventor, and he invented a bunch of great stuff, but they would not let him manufacture it or create it because the, the only mm. people who were in power or creating stuff there was the government. So he couldn't do any of that stuff. So uh, it, it, it was lucky for, for me because my dad kind of was able to sell some of these things um, and was able to make a little money that was extra than what we were. And that gave us an opportunity to also even think about getting out. But but it was illegal, literally. The KGB would would come and, and check, what are you making? What are you doing? So I would, I'm just doing it for, for our family or something like that. That's okay. But if you wanted to sell something, it was illegal. Hmm. That's how it is in Cuba. Yeah. You have to, everything has to go through the government in yeah. order to sell it. That's right. It's yeah. still the same way. Right. Yeah. Not working either. No, it is not. <laughs> no. Well, Yakov, <laughs> yeah. I... I yeah, I, I I appreciate yeah. you coming by today. I I, I mean I would I was in the car listening and I was just like I was screaming like I know yeah. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to take away our freedoms. Do you have any questions? Susan? Yes, you can't yeah. live like this. Yes. I just I'm anti-communist. I still am. I was raised that way, and I'm just I you know this whole fantasy about it making it better for everybody is not right. And I our younger generation needs to know that. And, you know, yeah. we, we fought communism. <clears throat> Our parents fought communism, and then they're all gone now, some from COVID. But, um, you know, I still carry that torch. I, get, I, I just don't think it's a good way to go. And I, it's nice to hear, like, the way, yeah. You, yeah, the way that you explain it and you lived it, it just it brings it all back. Because when yeah. when uh, US, USSR fell apart, it was um, it was horrible for the people. People were starving, and and you know it didn't suddenly go back to democracy. Once you're in communist, it's very hard to change. And I know that like the mafia came in, and and people were taking right. over, and it was just people were freezing to death and starving to death. And you know there's no there's no turning back from con communism in an easy way. And um, well, so that, that's they, what worries they were, me, is that we're going to go way to the left. Yeah, it was like uh, animals in the zoo that were taken care of badly, but taken care of. And now the zoo uh, was let go and all the animals are got to fend for themselves and they don't know how. Uh, they, that mm. was killed. Right. That, that desire to take care of themselves and be creative and wanting to win uh, and willing to lose uh, it, it just because you have some good ideas, that that is not an easy skill uh, to create. 
And America was able to do that. And that's ideology, mm -hmm. that ideology is scary to socialists. You see, socialists, can they don't play well with anybody. Uh, ca uh, uh, capitalists will allow everybody to play. Uh, they will, you know, you want to be socialist, you want to be uh, even fascist, whatever. We will allow this as long as you play by the rules. Socialists don't allow anything, anybody. They have to be destroyed. That way socialism can live. It's a concern. I, I think that, you know, much like when David Letterman uh telegraph that you might lose your job i'm I'm going to telegraph this evening that your career may be reignited because the present moment sort of i think people would be interested that's why that's why i asked to talk to you i think people would be interested in your perspective and your stories and what happened and you know now that you're a psychologist it sort of gives you a certain professional gloss that you know people will listen so i so i hope you go back out there and uh start chatting it up I just, in fact, well, you you got fact, you got I, me started. I, I got you started. You got in fact, me. I just sent a I just sent an email to Greg Gutfeld, and I said, "This I think Yaka would be great on your show." Do you ever? You, wouldn't he? Yes. Do you ever watch that show? Uh, not Gutfeld? not not yeah, not every night, but I've seen it. Yes. But you are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they bring comedy into politics, so it's not like you'd be really you know you don't feel show. like you're on the spot for your. Yeah, you can so. you can actually say something funny and people will laugh. So. So, well, it's 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 meant to be funny. So. Yeah. All right. And we well, have to laugh, and and uh, you know, because and women laugh differently than men. So what? You know. <laughs> so, see, that's where we started. <laughs> I heard it. I was so in the car is, listening. What's your take on that? I love that. I love how the women like just want to be held and and be talked to nicely, and the men are like, "Yeah, she's got to look good, and I want sex, and she has to clean. Okay, she has to take care of the house too." <laughs> I was like, and Drew was like, "He's getting started, you know. He's got a little cough, and you're like, okay, that was funny, you know." <laughs> no, it, it's interesting, and it, I think humor is super important, and we have a lot of humor in our relationship because. You know, it's pretty funny living with Drew. So, <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not, he's a good guy. As long as it's not, as long as it's not pointing and laughing, that's the part that we don't. We don't. Oh, like. uh, I did kind of do that, but it's okay. I do. Oops. I try not to. What, what was? What was? I don't remember what you do. It, I'm, so I'm not going to say it. That you guys. You no, you guys. Not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're okay we're doing, i'm not gonna doing. say it no that's for after dark where do you so. uh, where do you live now Yakov? i permanently i moved from california uh, after covid started i moved from malibu to missouri so i live in branson missouri and uh, we are mm. here uh with my wife in florida kind of trying to figure out you know where in Florida we might want to have like a, a, a winter home. Uh, and so we're nice. driving around looking, looking around here. Yeah. That's great. I like that comment too. He said, what he drew like all serious. What are we going to do? And he goes, we're going to move to Florida, yeah, the whole right. world. <laughs> well, at least we have that. Well, for I, now, I think yeah. that you know, in, <laughs> it is in all seriousness. Or Germany, I, maybe. I, I don't two know. two things I keep thinking, which is one, the founding fathers really were serious geniuses, and thank God that the documents they put together, as flawed as they might be, there's the, a deep, profound genius in what they put together. Number one, and then number two, the advantage of having fifty independent states is is a very unique, dynamic, interesting sort of an asset that uh, I I think it's all going to save us. That's what I think. I think we're going to be okay, humbly. I, I hope so. I hope so. But I think this awareness is where we can kind of uh, sharpen up a little bit and, and be aware that this, um, this experiment has been already done many times in 20th century. And we don't want yep. to lose American experience. Yeah. 
All right, my friend. It's uh, great to talk to you. And uh, I'm getting really profound can, feelings. Hopefully, from we this. can cross paths somewhere <laughs> whenever we're out and about and in Florida. Or Thanks New York for or reaching something. out. Yeah. Or, 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 Thank or, you. Thank for, you for uh, coming on. Yeah. My pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. and uh, All right. and uh, may may I give Gutfeld your contact info if <laughs> uh, if he wants you? I, I I don't don't do this yet. Don't do. <laughs> Let me. <Okay>. Think about <laughs> it. All right. Fair enough. All yeah. right, think about Thanks it. Thanks so much. All right, All right. well, Yaakov Smirnov, thank you so much, buddy. Yaakov.com is where you can find more. And uh, I, I think maybe you understand kind of why I was interested in in chatting with him. I just thought it was, I, I haven't talked to him in a few years and he had all these great stories about what it was, what's, what a what's nice really guy. like to deal with these things. And his interesting psychology research he was doing too. I always thought that was interesting. Living the American dream, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, he is. It's just, and he's just, he just, he's a historical, he's got a, he lived in, he, he was a part of history. I know. Right. I mean, he it's found true. himself in the white house. He was he's the Russian with, comedian. Yeah. He was, you know, he was in Russia, lived all through that. And he, then he came here and ends up in the white house. Which is so crazy. huh? And for you and me, that was sort of our, <laughs> our salad years, you know, yeah. our adolescence and things. I mean, you know, he in. was good and he was, but he, mm. the behind the scenes in politics, like it's so funny. It's, you know, when you, yep. it's kind of cool. Well, because I have this diverticulitis, I really do run I out know, of steam. And you got that little cough still. I got to get the humidifier. This cough was a lot better yeah, like, just like a couple hours ago. We got to get a cough button for you. Yeah, that would be nice. I wish I knew how to do that. No. Hey, Caleb. Caleb. Oh, I know how. We yeah, gotta... let's <laughs> definitely. I 100% agree. Good idea. I just don't know why he's he still, I mean, it. I'm still coughing a little bit, but maybe you need to drink more water. But we want to talk about the bobblehead before we go because- okay. Go ahead. Because I want you to talk about it. Um, Show them the box. There's a box underneath the table, too. I want everybody to see it. I don't know if anybody knows. It's on the other side, sweetie. The floor. We're very proud of our Dr. Drew bobblehead. Uh, it comes <laughs> in this fabulous box with uh, well, some of the history of the man himself. Wow. Interesting. As you can see. And uh, yes, it's uh, available today for you and your and your friends. And and I think we've had some really good submissions to where is Dr. Drew. I don't know if Caleb's got anything available for us to take a look at, but some of the photos are really great. Like, um, I don't know. Let's see. Do you have anything, Caleb? Uh, I don't have it pulled up right now. I don't have it ready. Sorry. Oh, okay. But I can put it. All some, right. I this thought we going to do that today. With some info. But anyways, we have, he, yes, it's a, uh, if you post a creative photo with your Dr. Drew bobblehead on Instagram or Twitter and use the hashtag, where is Dr. Drew? And then also maybe tag Dr. Drew Pinsky on Instagram or Dr. Drew on Twitter. We will uh, send you an autographed uh, bobblehead for your grandma or your mom or your your brother or whoever is a fan. And we're going to sweeten the pot a little bit. Uh -oh, uh, not only is 10% of the proceeds going to go to hillsides.org, which is a uh, foster care program here in Pasadena that we is near and dear to our hearts. So part of the proceeds will go there, 10%. And then as well as um, we're going to sweeten the pot and say, if you get, um, if you win, you will be a guest on Ask Dr. Drew. Ooh, I like that. And you can ask well Dr. Drew whatever you want. Oh, so goodness. it's kind of a, a moment right. and you can, you know, get your camera. Well, did you did you come up with this scheme while you were driving over here today? No, no. We had a okay. meeting today. Okay. okay. But you know, when you were interrupting me, remember mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. I do. Anyway, so um yeah, no, we're we're <laughs> we're ramping up the uh PR here and we just want everybody to know that it's you know, it's kind of a fun, fun way to get your um I don't know if you wrote a book, you might want to do it and get your book on the Ask Doctor Drew show, or if you want to like, and you might be able to bring, you know, some family or whatever with you want. It's it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Well, I have to go lie down. So all right, so so Drew's got to go lay down, and we really appreciate your uh, your time, and hope that everybody enjoyed that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Yaakov. Uh, I'm going to end the. I'm going to go fix clubhouse. the fireplace. Uh oh. And in the clubhouse, and uh, we will see you all. What's what is our next? Uh, is it Tuesday? Let's look at a drdu.com slash shop. Tuesday, we have Heather Dubrow in here. Heather Dubrow on Tuesday. Yeah, we're gonna. What are we doing Monday? Are we gonna do an Ask Doctor Drew? Uh, possibly, if you want. Okay. Why? Possibly. Oh, we have to I'll see look at the calendar. Okay. Okay. 
All right. So we'll see you guys. See you next week. Thank you for being here. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help. Thank you.